Hi everybody, Fox Nomad here, and today I want to help you travel smarter by sharing a recent episode of the Fox Nomad podcast with you. My guest is Vivian Rigney. He is the author of Naked at the Knife Edge, which is a book about his climb of Mount Everest and what he's learned from that climb. But he has not only summited Mount Everest, he's also climbed to the highest peak on every continent, something known as the Seven Summits. In this episode, we talk about why Vivian wanted to climb all these mountains, where the idea for such an adventure came from, of course, stories from those trips and what he's learned and what you can learn from being on top of the world. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Vivian Rigney. Thanks very much, uh, Vivian, for taking the time to talk to me today. I, I really appreciate it. You have a very interesting story and, and it just gets more interesting, but I, I kind of want to start from this feat that you've accomplished, which is climbing the, the highest mountain on every continent. Am I, am I correct? Correct. Yeah. It's called the seven summits. And where did that, like, how did that begin? I mean, were you mountain climbing before I would assume, um, but was this something that you started as a child, you know, younger and then kind of built your way up or was this something that, that you came across later in life? Yeah, it's a funny, uh, it's a good question. I, I, I was, it, my dad was a, was a climber and a mountaineer and, he used to drag me up every Sunday up the rainy and wet hills in Ireland. And I really didn't want it as a child. I wanted to be at home. I wanted to be my friends. And um, so I have that distinct childhood memory of not looking forward to climbing wet mountains. And then I grew up and I moved away and I left Ireland when I was 19 and I ended up living in South Africa. And when I was down there, people were talking about Kilimanjaro. And I remember having an idea one day, well, I've got a business trip in Tanzania. Why don't I just go climb Kilimanjaro? I'm 26 years old, like everything's possible, right? And uh, so I got fit and I uh, and, uh, went to climb Kilimanjaro and I realized a couple of things. First of all, not every mountain in the world is as rainy as Ireland. Uh, and uh, the other thing was, it's beautiful. And uh, altitude has this impact on, on your body and on your mind. And I'd never experienced that before. Uh, before, if I worked hard enough, I trained hard enough, you just get, get to the top of whatever you're doing. And altitude sickness is an invisible impact on your body. So your brain says, just go. And your body says, uh, no, thank you. Not feeling good. And this kind of disconnect, it was the first time I'd ever experienced that. My drive was not enough. I had to listen to my body. So that was where it started. And I became fascinated with it. I heard about the seven summits on Kilimanjaro and slowly embarked on a journey. Uh, of uh, going to each continent and uh, having incredible uh, travels and experiences along the way and difficult climbing too. It was no cakewalk. And some of them were extremely difficult and some had setbacks and Everest, of course, was uh, was very, way more difficult than I imagined. Um, but yeah, a, a real journey of experience. And I have heard that Kilimanjaro is sort of the mountain to begin with. If you're going to start really doing mountain climbs was it part of your plan or was it just it was nearby and uh you know uh, let's let's give it a shot uh, yes and yes so it was nearby and Kilimanjaro is basically a massive volcano but it's 6,000 meters you know 20,000 feet so it's a very tall volcano um and it was it was a good it's a good entry one because you you see a lot of nature as well from at the at the um at the very bottom of Kilimanjaro you have wonderful safari and then you go into the uh, coffee plantations and you go to the tea plantations then you're in the rainforest then you're in the tundra it's this really interesting and eventually you're up at the top where there's some snow and, and ice so it's a really wonderful journey to start with and how do you prepare for the the, the altitude I, I i mean you know when, when you start the climb i, I i'm imagining that you have sort of an idea of what's going to happen, but how is it different when you start getting up in those higher altitudes? Something that maybe most of us who haven't, you know, climbed such tall mountains have experienced. It's not really something you can prepare too much for because uh, look, altitude is, uh, acclimatization is based on your red blood cells propagating and you need more of them to work with less oxygen and be efficient. And when you're at sea level, then you don't have, many red blood cells whatsoever so you're not so good for mountains but your body only holds even if i was at everest you know today 
and I trained for a couple of months. And I was in great shape. After about one week, your red blood cells dissipate. Your body goes back to normal balance at sea level. So, so for most climbers, it doesn't really help that you're, you know, at a high level going to Everest. You, most people um, go there and slowly acclimatize and then reach their goal. So, and that's part of the thing in never experiencing it before. You have to really think how everyone reacts differently to altitude. So uh, it, it's quite interesting it, listening to your body and recognizing what your body actually needs. And, you know, after that first climb, was it more difficult? Was it easier than you anticipated when all was said and done? Did you look back and say that was something I would love to do again, something I might do again? I mean, clearly it, ins it inspired something in you, but, but was there a, a time after where you maybe were a little unsure or did it just push you more? Um, the idea was great. Kilimanjaro was great. Uh, but I've always had a fear of heights. So you could imagine when I got to some of the later ones that caused uh, a lot of trauma in my mind of how do I overcome this? And I believe a fear of heights is something you're born with. I think some people have zero fear and people like me, I just have it. But you learn tricks of the mind to um, not listen to the inner dialogue and reduce the noise or be distracted by something else that's, that's more, that induces more peace in mind. Um, but I had to work quite hard at that. And Everest was, of course, the big one at the end. And that was uh, wildly stressful to begin with. And slowly I had to, again, face those demons of that fear and my inner dialogue saying, you know, this, this is scary. And, and, you know, there's so many obstacles and so much danger around. So, uh, yeah, I had to, I had to work at it. So I imagine, you know, you're, you're climbing one of these mountains, Everest, for example, and you get to a point, like many of us do when you're in a stressful situation where there's maybe a panic point where you start, I don't know if you've come across this, but the feeling to just go back down, just to give up, um, you know, how do you push through that when you might, you might die? I mean, this is a life or death situation. How do you push through that, that fear to just, I don't know if that occurred to you, but just to go back, just to say, all right, that was enough. Uh, let's get back down to a, a normal height. Yeah. And those fears are very real because again, you're, you're listening to your body, but you're also your, our negative inner dialogue starts off and starts telling us things, you know, this feels too much. You're really tired today. You're not feeling good. And what's happening around you also has an, an influence on that. So if people are sick around you, if people are, are in trouble, if people are turning down the mountain you know, on Everest, if you're, pa if you're passing areas where you know there are bodies, all of these things can take away from your motivation and drive that. I, I think it takes an inner, some sort of inner drive to push past that, to recognize, is that me or is there reality here that I really need to listen to? And in most cases, particularly if you're with a good team, you can ask people for help. You can engage with your colleagues. You can feel as though you're part of a team and it somehow reduces the burden. The load is lighter. You're together. There's an energy together. There's a thinking when you're together. And that really helps. And uh, that was extremely helpful for me. That didn't actually, you know, when I got to summit day and I had an extremely difficult summit day, uh, I, I did come to a grinding halt uh, south of the summit and uh, went through quite a painful internal uh, journey there before you know, I was ultimately su successful. Uh, but, but most oftentimes, you know, that level of support is extremely helpful. And, and so after you've, you've now done Kilimanjaro and, and Everest is the last mountain to be conquered, how do any of the mountains prepare you for Everest, you know, on the way? Are they different as someone who doesn't mountain climb? I just assume they all are really difficult. And then Everest is another level on top of that, it seems like. Yeah, everyone is different. I know you've traveled like a lot, uh, like I. So the wonderful thing about climbing mountains in different parts of the world is there's, a, there's an amazing cultural experience that goes with that culture, climate, environment, conditions, weather, all of those things are different on each mountain, on each continent. So each time you have to kind of reset, calibrate, 
uh, dig deep, learn along the way, overcome obstacles, question yourself, wonder about yourself, figure out who am I, where am I, what's going on. Um, and that's, I guess, part of the attraction is, is that uh, like a traveler, you uh, might be in countries that are difficult to get around or and you have to be creative and, you know, how life may work in a very organized way in New York City, where I live, might be totally irrelevant in Nepal. And uh, you just got to get with the program really quickly and let go. And this letting go would be a, a common theme in, in the book I've just written about the climb. Uh, naked at the knife edge where where it is very much about letting go and embracing vulnerability and, and realizing that as a strength um but the personal journey that goes with that is 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 the key that unlocks that door and, and it seems like a contrast you know from new york city to these places that are wild right it, it, it's it seems like a difficult transition almost it's funny, I remember arriving in Nepal and we, you know, we got to the airport uh, in Kathmandu. We were flying into Lukla. Lukla is at the foothills of Everest. Uh, we're all excited. We have our bags. We're, we're, we're there. We arrive at the airport and there's a power cut. So there's no electricity. And, uh, but everything is just working as normal. So I went up to the guy in the peaked hat, you know, the, the uh, looked like the expert, Mr. Mr. Information. And I said, hey, we're flying to Lukla and our flight's scheduled to leave at 10.30, you know, uh, are we on time? And he looked at me and he, he rubbed his chin and he smiled. I could tell he was, he was laughing away inside. And he said, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, hopefully this week. And I just, I just found myself, I started to laugh then because I thought, here is Mr. New York coming into Nepal, giving him like, our flight leaves at 10.20, just checking if we're on time. And we're in a part of the world, which is we are in the Himalaya. There, there are no, there's no radar where we are. It's all very much weather and tuition. And, and, uh, and it's funny, I, I just said, Vivian, you need to reset, bro. You just let go. Just, just, just let go of the schedule. You, we, we, will, we will be brought there. Uh, we'll get there, okay. But 50 minutes later, Anil, there was uh, somebody to my right who was having the same conversation with the guy and he was getting really frustrated and he was saying, we could just, I could watch his lips, he was saying things like, that's impossible, you must be specific, I want to know. And uh, it was a moment where I just said, wow, I just want to make sure I'm not that guy because that guy trying to control the uncontrollable, it was a moment, it was a, it was a funny moment, but also a serious moment of, wow, life learning here right now. Uh, yeah. You, you do kind of have to go with the flow in that part of the world. Otherwise, it's going to just wash over you and take you, sweep you away. And it it's not going to be very fun. <laughs> it will. Yeah. It's just easier that way. And uh, the same result happens. So it's not like, you know, you gain or lose. It is what it is. And in New York, it, it's almost the opposite of that, right? It has its own flow and style, and you, you have to just acclimate to that in, in the same way, right? I assume, you know, it's, it's not as laid back, right? You have, you know, schedules and everything. It's just a different thing to get used to. A different vibe. And it's funny, like our schedule had, in, had, in, had built in a good time for that. So everything was fine. Um, but the default is a default and human nature is that we, we love things to be predictable, don't we? So that was a moment. And is that some of the appeal of mountain climbing is that you are out of control, that there, there's just something that you can kind of give into and, and, and kind of, I think all of us, we, in, you know, who live in the, I guess, in cities, you have this stress that we create for ourselves, but when you go into nature, that stress is somewhat lifted in, in the sense that you can be very focused on one particular thing as opposed to a million other things, which don't seem very important when you're, you know, on a mountain. Yeah, it's really interesting. When you go to a mountain, you realize the mountain has been there for millennia, thousands and probably in many cases, millions of years. And in the city, we're just looking at people all the time or busyness or our transactional lives. You go there we are the visitor in this in this area and that's um and that we feel you feel very small but you also feel very humble and there's an opportunity to learn because don't forget we're with ourselves 24 7 
and that inner dialogue we have at a mountain, there's a lot of silence. There's very little distraction. So we're with our, thought, with our thoughts all the time. And that's part of the gift that if we start to listen to our thoughts, we can challenge them and uh, perhaps uh, feel a bit closer to our real selves or authentic selves uh, and let go of things along the way. And that's the wonderful beauty of nature for mountains. It's a, a natural uh, gateway to coming home in a way. And are, are there particular moments that stand out out of all of these seven summits where you saw something or you've, you've felt something or thought something that was really unique to that moment, to that place? Are, are there some that just come to mind? One image, I mean, Everest has many, and you know, they're, they're all described in detail. But one I'll, I'll share with you was when we were on our summit day and we left at 8 p.m. from the from high cap, the South Call. It's camp four, next stop is, is the summit, but it's an enormous climb to get there. And, um, We've been climbing through the whole night, extremely cold, and we've been waiting a long time, a lot of stops because people were sick. So we were, our feet were cold, our fingers were cold. Myself and the team, I was convinced I was getting frostbite and bad things were going to happen. I was learning, well, I won't be able to walk again, won't be able to use fingers. All of these dark thoughts were coming in and, and because we were stuck, we were that the line was ground to a halt and we couldn't move. And that was very scary. But I do remember at around 4.59 in the morning, I remember something magical happened on the horizon. And uh, on the horizon at that height, at about, you know, 8,700 meters, that's about 28,000 feet, 28,500 feet. It's so high, you can actually start to see the curvature of the earth. But we started to see daybreak. And the horizon. So we went from this place of being, you know, looking at stars, but being extremely cold and, you know, feeling very exposed. And as I said, very, very stressed because we were getting cold and, and we were worried that was going to have a traumatic impact on our bodies to the first vestiges of light on the horizon. And then slowly the brightness, the brightness, the brightness, and then the sun rises. And I remember looking at that horizon and thinking, my God, Every day in my life is a reset, every single day. And I, when I look down, the thought that everyone below me on the planet, everybody is below me. I'm at a point in the planet that is above every single living human being other than ourselves and perhaps people in the space station or pilots. But the population, 7 billion people are below us. And the sun rising every day, and Neil, we have a reset. Do we choose to agree to that reset? Or do we want to be product, a product of yesterday, a product of our fears of yesterday, our concerns of yesterday, worries or angst? And it was a profound moment where I said, that's ownership that we have. We have the keys to that if we remember to have the keys. And, and that was something that struck me that moment. I, I really want to have that ownership. And remember it every single day and it, it, it you've taken a lot of that experience and, and sort of brought it to teaching other people how to take that that strength and, and embrace that reset and and de you know develop those skills into things applicable in the you know i guess in the urban world um, with leadership are those elements that you honed would you say or are those things that you really learned like did your personality change or your outlook change a lot or i'm you know i'm thinking you've climbed the all these mountains that you have to be a, a somewhat confident person someone who is unique or different than the most mo, you know most of us is that that's kind of how i i look at it so how can you know how do we learn from that in other words, do we all have to climb mountains or how would you take it? I think that was a channel, that was a, a road which I took, but I think each of us has our own Everest. It could be a dream we have, it could be bereavement, it could be a, you know, a job we aspire to or a job we didn't get. It could be a setback for some of us, our parents, children. That's every day is like this massive you know, learning curve and, and roller coaster, ups and downs. I think we, I think we have our Everest, every single one of us. 
it's a question of thinking, what does that mean for me? And what do I need to let go of in order to succeed, in order to grow, in order to be a better version of myself, but also to let go of some of the junk from the past, let go of some of the insecurities, let go of the things I believed about myself or I believe about others or when I'm burning energy. Uh, I like to think there's two finite things in life. Time, we can't create more of that. Uh, for the, we, can't, we can't fix the past. It's done, it's gone. And energy, uh, we have a finite amount of energy. And if we waste it, it's energy we don't have for other things. And uh, that's, been, that's been particularly helpful to reflect on that. And do you think, why do you think we hold on to the past so much? Is that a product of being distant from nature? Is that a, is a product of just our biology? Why do you think we hold on to it so dearly? You know, why does it hold us back at times? Yeah, I think, I think we're in a way we're, we're, we're conditioned to believe that our past is who we are. So when we grow up, uh, very oftentimes it can be told you're your father's son, you're your mother's son. And we grew up in a, you know, a strong family unit. And that's great when you're a child, right? You want to be part of something, to be a tribe. You go to school, you're educated, you have society, depending on where you grew up or how you grew up. So there's a lot of norms which you have to conform to when we're younger. And then we get to adulthood. In a way, those norms can feel very familiar. But the, the challenge to that is, yes, it feels familiar, but is that me? Or is that what I think it is of me? I had somebody in here yesterday. And they were wanting to, I work as an executive coach. I help business leaders be much more emotionally intelligent. And this person said to me, look, I'm, you know, I've got this huge work ethic and I'm very intense and that's just me. And I said, really? Okay, that's great. When did you decide that was you, that you were going to be really intense? And he goes, what are you talking about? I said, it's always been me. I said, really, were you born like that? And he goes, yes, I was. Yeah. And I really, uh, how do you know you come out of the womb like that? I'm, I'm wildly curious now. And he took a breath. And he, bum he bumbled a few words, and then he said, you've got me there. And I said, what do you mean? Uh, I probably didn't come out of the womb being an intense person. And I said, I agree. Not too many babies are flailing around the floor, worried about stuff. They're generally just present. And he laughed, and he said, I'm making it harder for myself, haven't I? And I said, yes, but you're just not listening to yourself. You're putting beliefs on yourself that aren't you, but you're, you're, you're agreeing that they should hang around and impact you and drive you and almost hijack you. So it was a breakthrough for him to think, ah, so where did I get that from? And for him, it was parenting. I remember my, my dad had the weight of the world on his shoulders, and I, I kind of thought that was normal. And now I don't work like that, but I guess I do. And I guess it's become me. And if it can become you, and it'll, it can unbecome you can unhitch it if it's something you learned then it's possible to unlearn and and that's the uh that's a powerful powerful moment of truth and that that's an interesting point you bring up is unlearning something it, it, it's almost i guess if you're a type a personality or you have this very intense mindset like the person you're speaking about then you can think i need to do more things to overcome this problem whereas potentially maybe doing less or letting go a little bit or, you know, whatever it happens to be, you know, sometimes I, I suppose the, the route isn't always just directly ahead, right? You know, we can get right. <laughs> um, Yeah, it's funny. And people, I always have a laugh when people go, oh, Vivian, geez, I'm having a moment here. You're so right. You know, I, I really need to let go. I, I really need to, you know, uh, be better balanced. And I come back and say, whoa, 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 tell me that word again. I, I need, and, and they're giving this, it's almost like you can hear them putting additional burdens on themselves, almost like they're putting additional weights in their backpack. It's the opposite. You have to let go of weights. You have to move from need to want. What's going to motivate you to let go? What's going to motivate you to uh, be lighter, to be more present, to worry about stuff you that matters and to not worry about the stuff you can't control anyway. It really has to be our unconscious subconscious mind pushes us away from, from need to must do. Uh, and it stresses us out and it moves toward. I want to, um, it's, it's a subtle difference, but it's, it's very powerful and that's internalized. 
it, it, as you were saying that it, it evoked this image of of you climbing Everest, for example, and I and you would think when you're up there, you're not alone. You're with a team, and there are other people, you know, ahead of you and behind you. But you are very isolated, right? You're very at the will of the elements. Um, you would almost think that the things you're carrying give you comfort, you know, the jacket, the extra rations, the extra this and that. But it seems like you might have to ditch some of those things to get to the top, right? Some of those things that are giving you that temporary comfort there uh, might actually be holding you back from, from climbing the summit. In a really basic level, it's a great question. It's a really basic level. When we think on Everest, you're climbing in a desert. And people go, what do you mean? There's snow everywhere. There's ice everywhere. Well, if you want, if you want water, you can't eat snow. You're going to get frostbite. You burn way too much energy getting too cold. So it's a desert. So to get water, you have to melt ice and extrapolate the water. But the other thing about climbing on Everest is water is heavy. It's extremely heavy. So the more water you can carry, you can carry gallons of the stuff, liters of the stuff but you're going to burn fuel. You're going to burn your energy in doing that. So that's very inefficient. So you have to really measure what's the amount of water I need. And I'll have a little, a little extra, but I cannot overburden myself. And it's really interesting. Water becomes a gift of life survival and also a burden uh, that can, that can have negative impact. So one has to balance and it's a bit like our negative inner dialogue or, or worries we have to balance. On the one hand, we need drive, we, we need aspiration. That's a good thing to lean in toward and, and obviously want that. But on the other hand, we have to know when do we say enough? When do we say stop? I'm not going down that road. Or that's a belief I have, but it's, you know, it, it's conjecture more than fact. And it's time to let go of that. And when you're, you know, when you're climbing a mountain, it seems like those those points can be very obvious when you're, you know, you think you're getting frostbite or there's a storm coming in or so on. In our modern lives, we don't always have those obvious signs that something is off or that, you know, we have this fight or flight response. Um, how, how do you think people can, how do you know even now, you know, when you feel like, okay, something is off and, but, you know, it's not a matter of freezing to death. How, how, how do you differentiate that? I think it's uh, differentiating the noise in our head to what our intuition is telling us. So that's a, that's a, that's a big thing. And, and most people, we, we are intuitive, but we want to double check our intuition. We want to reference it. So we tap the brake instead of the accelerator. Now, when we're, when we're much younger, we don't have much intuition. It's a lot of it is instinct, right? We're, we're just learning so much. We don't know. We don't know. We get to later in life, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s. We have a lot of experiences. If we tap into those, the answer normally is there. And if you ask somebody, and you have a st very strong gut feel about something, what percent of the time is that born out to be correct? Most people say most of the time, the vast majority of the time. But if they ask themselves, how often do they, do they hear it? and act on it unfortunately it's very often a lot less they're worried about failure they're worried about what other people think of them and they're they're less focused on being true to themselves and being authentic and uh, if we come back to the mountain premise of to climb you need to be lighter the higher you go up you need to be lighter and lighter as the task gets tougher and uh, it's a bit like leadership it's um you know to be a really good leader it's about influencing others, not doing the work, not down in the weeds and getting all stressed and intense. Higher touch, it's wiser, it's being, bringing your full self without the baggage every day as best you can. And I'm imagining on a lot of those climbs, there are people who may have come to a point where they did have to turn around, where they couldn't summit the mountain for whatever reason. Um, and I wonder if you if you've come across that, or I wonder if that's discouraging, or if that just pushes you further to try it again, or maybe to be happy with the attempt that you made. Um, you know, depending on the situation, I, I always think about the people who got very far but didn't quite make it to the top of the mountain. How do they feel? 
well, that was me. So my second, uh, my second seventh, my second summit out of the seven was Aconcagua in Argentina. And we had been, it was a two week expedition. It got stretched out to three weeks because the weather was bad. We reached all the way to high camp. We could actually see the summit. It was probably another 12 hours, you know, uh, climb, but we could see the summit uh, and this massive windstorm came in. We lost some tents. We lost some food. And the group leader came in at, at three in the morning and said, we're getting off this mountain in three hours. It's over. We cannot do this. We've lost tents. I'm calling it. And I remember, and it took us another four or five days to get down. I remember feeling incredible disappointment. Uh, and that was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Because if I worked hard enough at that point, I tended to get what I wanted, right? I could achieve, right? Effort equals performance. And in that case, I couldn't control it. So, and I went back and did that one again a few years later. Uh, and I felt a lot of joy in doing it a second time because I was uh, that, that idea that failure can be such an inherent part of learning and and that's okay. And, and failure is just as healthy as achievement as long as we're learning and the ability to be open to that. Wow. That, that, uh, it reminds me of that Michael Jordan quote, you know, he said, I've just failed more than everybody else. I, I, I always think that's such an interesting way to look at it. Um, and what led you to, to write the book? So was that something that you had in mind after like, you just climbed Kilimanjaro? I, I just feel like after that, there would be this high of like, I need to tell everybody, you know, this this lesson, or was that later on that, that occurred to you that maybe I should put these down in writing? Yeah, it was, it's funny. When I came back from Everest, um, a lot of climbers, they write a book very quickly. In the first year, it's almost like get everything down before I forget. And I didn't feel that urge. Um, and I remember I felt procrastination around doing that. And I remember being tough on myself. And I'm, why am I not writing it? I was just, I'm, I'm very busy at work. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And years later, I was still thinking about it. And then I started to map it out. And, and then the pandemic hit. Nothing like a good pandemic to, uh, to break us out of our, uh, our, our habits, right? And the pandemic felt like a very, very vulnerable moment for, for, for society, and certainly for me. And it was an immediate urge of, I do have a story to tell. And this feels like the right time to tell that story. And I started to write and it flowed and it felt that the years intervening from when I climbed to when I was writing the book, the wisdom had marinated and I had, I could join the dots on the story and, and the work I do as a work as a coach. So I'm in a reflective mode every day uh, with my clients and I gain a huge amount. I learn a huge amount from them and it all seemed to come together. So yeah, sometimes you, um, when the student is ready, the teacher, the professor appears, right? Uh, that was very true with Everest. So, uh, yeah, it took the time it needed to take, right? And, and I'm, I'm happy with the end result. And uh, I will, for everybody listening, leave a link to the book, Naked at the Knife Edge, down in the show notes, so you can check it out and get it from wherever you get your books. The Naked at the Knife Edge, What Everest Taught Me About Leadership and the Power of Vulnerability. Um, do you have, I sometimes have this, which is kind of a weird I suppose, problem to have, you know, do you look back and go, I mean, looking now we're talking about looking in the past, but saying, I miss that, that, that rush of climbing a mountain, or maybe I should do Everest again, or do you, is there kind of a withdrawal that happens when you go to such an exciting experience that they, that is difficult to replicate? I mean, it's very, there's only one Everest in the world. So um, do you have any withdrawal or what are your new? <laughs> yeah, quite, quite the opposite, actually. So Everest was very difficult and the book goes into great detail on the personal journey. So Summit Day was very difficult and uh, I really questioned why I was there. I, I didn't know why I was there ultimately and uh, realized that in my life up to that point, I'd been focused too much on achievement, too much on, 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 on proving that I was good enough, strong enough, hardworking enough 
successful enough. So I came down the mountain, um, I think a different person. And I realized I need, if I need, if I'm chasing some things, the one question I need to answer is why am I doing that? Not why I think I'm doing that or why it would be good in the eyes of others, but why am I doing that? And uh, so I decided to give the mountains a break for a while. I took up scuba diving. I've been traveling wildly and um, just having wonderful experiences in doing that and discovering nature. And the, the planet obviously is under pressure at the moment. So it's good to see all these things as much as one can at the moment and be more present with myself and um, listening more to myself, listening to others. Um, being more observing what's happening around me. There's, it's, we live in an amazing world and, and people are inherently uh, fantastic and, and beautiful inside and, and, and really allowing to understand everyone's positive intent. How do we unlock that um, and get out of our silos, get out of our, our, uh, our judgments? And uh, that's been a lot of fun. And uh, as I say, the, the, the world is just amazing and uh, there's a lot of it out there. So I would advise people just to peel back the layer one trip at a time, one experience at a time. Any uh, good scuba diving spots that, that you particularly like? Uh, well, I, I went big and I went out to Fiji for the first time and I did my license out there and that was just something out of this world. And then I've been to wonderful places since um, Indonesia and and um, yeah and the Caribbean and so forth and each one is different and but just when you're underwater it's interesting when you're underwater you hear one sound one sound only of your own breathing and we never really think of what our own breathing sounds like but when you have an oxygen tank on your back you know and a you know a respirator on your mouth, you you know all about your breathing, and it, in an odd kind of way, you feel alive, uh, but you also feel how precious oxygen is. And you're down there with fish, and the fish we are again visitors in their world, um, but it's an incredibly um, peaceful place, and it's very. It feels like in a way when you go scuba diving, it feels like you're meditating in a way, um, because you're extremely present. There is nothing to do apart from um, be with the current and observe what's happening around you and uh, be aware of your breathing. So uh, underwater yoga, one could call it, without too much movement. And so that's been great and a, a ton of fun. Great. And it, it, as we wrap things up, uh, I just want to say thank you for, for sharing your story and your insight. It's been fascinating. One thing that a lot of people I know who have been to Everest, either base camp, um, have good Sherpa stories. And I'm wondering if you have any, just people you've met. You, you mentioned one briefly uh, when we were talking earlier, but I was just wondering if you have any others. Um, it just seems like people come across Sherpas that have very different personalities, you know. <laughs> the climbs are seem easier yeah. for them. Yeah, I remember just being, there's a lot of stories in the book about, about the Sherpa people, but one story early on in the book where we were climbing, you know, we flew into Lukla, as I mentioned earlier, this kind of little, little airport at the foothills of Everest. And you walk in, you hike in for 10 days to acclimatize to get to base camp. You're staying at tea houses along the way. And I remember on day two or something, we were, uh, we were walking on the trail and feeling the altitude, right? And we're, we're slowing and we're huffing and we're puffing because we're coming from sea level. And we were climbing this hill, uh, not a steep hill, but steep enough. Not a, not, a, not a rock face, but steep and have to navigate rocks and so forth. And over to my right side, there was this Sherpa and this guy was carrying a massive wooden door on his back and it kind of had an attachment around his head. He was using his head to kind of help balance it. And this door was probably, you know, 150% of his body weight. And he flew past us. And not only that, when he turned to us, he said hello, he said namaste to each person on our expedition with a big smile. <laughs> I, just, I just couldn't get over. This guy's carrying 150% of his body weight. We're in bits here. And not only that, he has the time and the inclination to greet each one of us and to show full set of teeth 
And he was just so happy to be there. And he's carrying this because there's no roads there and carrying that up to them to the small little village or town ahead, much higher up. And just it was enormously humbling experience, but a, a wonderful Sherpa experience of how these folks can be so strong and kind and generous at the same time. It's, uh, it was powerful. Well, thank you for sharing that. It's a good lesson for us all, uh, I, I think. And um, I hope people read the book because there's a lot of good insight there. And um, it's, I, I, I am really fascinated with your take on, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to climb Everest again, right? It, 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 it it's a, <laughs> yeah, it makes, it makes, um, it's nice to hear that. I think it's, uh, not what you expect. Yeah. Right. I'll tell you an interesting thing. So by the way, the book is also on audio. So I went to the studio and recorded it and that was difficult to do, to relive that experience, to kind of relive reading my own book. Uh, so there's a different slant on that when I'm, the words are coming out of my mouth and I found myself getting quite, I could feel the emotions coming when I was reading the book into microphone or studio. So that was, uh, that was, that was, that surprised me. And uh, I, I suppose that evoked and solidified some of your feelings about, about the trip, but also you got to relive it too at the same time. Exactly. In, in a healthy way this time, the real <laughs> trip was tough, but this is uh, yeah, definitely healthier. And uh, what are you working on these days? Do you have any upcoming projects? Um, are, are you planning another adventure? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I do, I'm doing a lot of keynote speaking now from the book, and that's, there's a huge demand for that, especially as we come out of COVID. So that's taking up a lot of time. Uh, I definitely want to get under the, under, the, under, the, under the waves again and do more scuba diving. I want to go to some place in the world where the glaciers are melting and again, visit more before it goes away. I'd like to go to the Amazon again. So excited that hopefully we're through the other side of the pandemic uh, and we can do more of these things. So yeah, I feel, I feel very happy with just getting out of nature again. So. Well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I will leave a link to the book in the show notes and everywhere people can find you. Uh, it's been a real pleasure uh, having this conversation. I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, it, it, it sort of took me to that mountain climbing experience without having to climb a mountain because I, I'm one of those people that I don't look at a mountain ever, unless it's to ski. I don't look at it and go, I want to climb that. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> Some people may say that there's a lot of wisdom in that statement. That I might agree depending on the day. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. And thank you for, thank you for inviting me. It's been an honor. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Fox Nomad podcast. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe buttons down below. I'll have new videos for you every week and I'll see you in the next video.